right about now. now, now. One, one, two, two, three, three, hit me! Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Right About Now podcast. I'm John Small, your host, and thank you for joining me today. We've got a great show. My guest is Peter Melman, who was a writer on Seinfeld for six years. Yes, that Seinfeld, the hit show from 1990 to 1998. Peter is the brain behind such classic episodes as Yada 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 and Spongeworthy and The Implants. He has amazing stories to tell about that show, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. Yeah, you'd write a script and Barry and Jerry would give you notes and you'd rewrite the script and maybe you'd rewrite it again. And then at a certain point, we'd go into Larry and Jerry and they would, you know, close their door and spend, uh, you know, a couple hours or, or more or less. Um, depending on the quality of the script. But, um, you know, my office was, like, right next to theirs, and I used to sit there, like, feeling like this tinge of envy because I'd hear, I'd hear that, you know, they're, them talking without really being able to hear the words, but then I'd hear them bust into laughs, and I was thinking, God, they have such a better time writing than I do. Peter's also going to talk about his new book, Hashtag Me Again, and he's going to give us a little background on his career, where he started off at the Washington Post as a sports writer and working for Harold Cosell and the sort of crazy way in which he landed this dream job at Seinfeld. So we're going to get right to my conversation with Peter. But first, I wanted to remind you that if you find this show has value, you can support it at patreon.com backslash podcast. For only $3 a month, support the show and you will get one extra bonus episode sent directly to you. That's a super extra bonus episode of writing tips and tricks and just interesting stories from my guests. So if you find it valuable and you feel so inclined to support the show, then please visit patreon.com backslash writeaboutnowpodcast. I'd really appreciate the support. Okay, now on to my interview with Peter Melman. So Peter Melman, welcome to Write About Now. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. So excited to have you on the show. I have millions of questions for you. Let's start at the beginning, though, because I am curious, you know, where are you from? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Queens in New York. Fresh Meadows, which we, you know, called Fresh Ghettos. <laughs> it's better than Flushing. Yeah, but it, it, it was also kind of like if you wrote Flushing on the address, it would get there. <laughs> Nobody knew where Fresh Meadows was. Yeah, my mother insisted that I write Fresh Meadows whenever I was at summer camp and wrote letters to her because it was too embarrassing to have Flushing on the, on the outside of the envelope, like God forbid the mailman saw it. <laughs> Were you always writing comedy from a from a sort yeah. of early age? I I didn't really start writing comedy. Well, I mean, you know, the Washington Post. I wrote some funny stuff, and in my college newspaper, you know, I wrote a few humor pieces. One notable one, you know, was kind of like a primer on how to become a Jewish American princess, and it was you know kind of scandalous at the time. But you know, I was more interested in in journalism tell you the truth and um you know years later i was working at abc sports and you know i wasn't really writing i was working for howard cosell so you know i was like writing in his voice yeah then um i started just i became just a freelance magazine writer and i was writing some humor pieces but i wouldn't say it was comedy it was just you know like essays yeah somewhat all right. Well, I want to let's let's take me back a little bit further. So, okay. So you grew up in Queens. Obviously, you have a good sense of humor. Were, were, was your family funny? Was there a lot of joking around growing up? Mm. My family was kind. Of, my father was very quiet, but very punny. 
you know, he he was really great with wordplay. And um, my mom was kind of always very funny and, and still is at 93. Oh, that's amazing. Congratulations. That's incredible. Yeah. There's definitely something in the water in the boroughs, though, right? I mean, Larry David comes. I think he's from Brooklyn. Mel Brooks, yeah. is, Mel Brooks is from the Bronx. So many great comedians. Woody Allen, obviously. So many great comedians come from that area. What, what do you think it is? You know, they come from the boroughs because, you know, you're living in New York and you're having this full New York experience, but you're not part of the elite that are living in Manhattan. So I think that thing about having your nose pressed up against the glass of Manhattan, even when you're in Manhattan, kind of gives you that underdog mentality that leads to being funny. Right, for sure. I grew up in Westchester, so I don't, that doesn't really count. It's still like Where? Dobbs Ferry. Because <laughs> uh, I have a lot of friends from Scarsdale. Right. Well, that was more of the Jewish side of the the, the county. Yeah. Although I'm I'm a Jew, but I was like the few the, the three Jews that that were in Dobbs Ferry at the time. Um, all right. So you go to the Washington Post, and you're a sports writer, right? Uh, initially, that's that was your the beginning of your sort of professional career writing. Yeah. Um, and what kind of sports were you covering? Well, you know, it's like pretty much like everyone else. I started off covering like high school sports, but, you know, I wasn't really that interested in the games themselves. I was more interested in like things beneath the surface of high school sports. You know, like I was kind of fascinated by the outside influence like a basketball coach would have on his kids. And there were some legendary basketball coaches in the Washington area one of whom, you know, just died this weekend, uh, Morgan Wooten, who hmm. uh, was a, a total legend in the Washington area. So I was, you know, kind of like fascinated by all the things that went on beneath it. You know, like I would cover a game and see one kid who kind of, you know, made a horrible play that blew the game. And all I really wanted to do was interview that kid. <laughs> right. I really wasn't interested that much in reporting straight about what happened in this game. And, you know, the same thing happened when eventually I got to cover, you know, some Baltimore Oriole games and some college football games. They wanted me to cover, you know, this annual game between football game between Georgetown and Catholic University, which, you know, these are not football schools, but like I was fascinated more by the rivalry between these two non-football schools than I would be, you know, covering a game between, you know, Ohio State and Alabama. You know, right. That stuff was much more interesting. You're just more, like, more the human interest kind of behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, you know, like, I wanted to always kind of bring it down to a human level, which, you know, sports, there's, there's really nothing human about it when you just read about these game stories or you watch ESPN, I don't know. It's like so important about winning and losing, you know? And I, yeah. I don't know. That stuff just never interested me. But I always feel like sports writers get this license to kind of write in a way, a much freer way than other journalists get to write. I love reading good sports writing. Cause it's like, there's a long tradition of just, you know, being super creative with the way you, you, present a story. I mean, is that kind of what drew you to, to sports writing in general? That would have been the dream, yes. You right. know, there were, there aren't that many, you know, there are some notably great sports writers, but not that many of them, you know, like, yeah. uh, like Bob, Robert Lipsight from the New York Times was incredible, and Gay Talese wrote a lot of great sports stories, right. and, uh, you know, and Jim Murray out in Los Angeles and, you know, Tom Boswell at the Washington Post and Tony Kornheiser when he was with the New York Times and then the Washington Post, you know, but you're right. They got a lot of license and they got to write in a more interesting way than straight news people. But at the same time, that was a pitfall as much as it was a boon because, you know, there are a lot of people who shouldn't have been allowed to, you know, be throwing their opinions around and their own slants because really all they were were typically, you know, dumb sports fans who, instead of sitting in a bar and, 
you know, saying ridiculous things. They were getting to say ridiculous things in print. Yeah, and then later on the radio, on AM radio, and then well, pro- probably I mean, now. Well, AM radio, radio sports is truly the dumb row of, like, of sports. <laughs> You seem to be a huge sports fan. I mean, we'll get into that because your your character of your book is kind of what I would imagine Road Not Taken is you, right? I mean, Arnie Pepper yeah. <laughs> is yeah, you. exactly. Yeah. If I weren't so interested in those weirder aspects of sports that I was, you know, like I would have covered college games and then I would have gone to the pros and then I would have covered maybe the Redskins and then eventually be a columnist. That, you know, that was that the was path your that you wanted if you were in the sports department. But, you know, it just never seemed like it was for me. Yeah. And you got you got a little sidetracked. But you, so you mentioned that you after the post or maybe you worked for Howard Cosell, ABC yeah. Sports. Well, we had a very small step. We were writing. We were working on a show called Sports Beat, which was a sports journalism program on ABC Sports Beat. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to ABC Sports Beat. Today we originate from Los Angeles, California, where I am presently on assignment. This so coming we Thursday, had a very small staff, and you did everything. You know, I did everything from, you know, chirons to producing pieces to, you know, writing his on-air scripts. And, you know, that was a real education because, you know, Howard Cosell was always looking at a different side of sports, always kind of bringing sports back into the real world as opposed to having it be this kind of comfort zone for everybody, you know, where they could just sit and mindlessly watch a game. You know, Howard Cosell wouldn't allow that, which is, you know, why he was so hated and so admired at the same time. And you were a big fan of his, right, growing up? Huge fan. Huge, huge fan. What did you like about him? Well, first of all, I like the way he stood up for Muhammad Ali. You know, he was the only one when Ali changed his name. And, you know, I was like, you know, I was like eight years old. But for some reason, I was just fascinated by Muhammad Ali. And he was fun and exciting. And, you know, and then he, you know, he changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. And, you know, even the New York Times was still writing Muhammad Ali, also known as Cassius Clay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Howard Cosell was like the only person who stood up and said, hey, you know, a man has a right to his name. His yeah. name is Muhammad Ali, you know? And I was like so fascinated that this guy just stood for, you know, he was a lawyer. He, he, he stood for what was right and what was just. And at the same time, he was doing it in a playpen, you know, because... You know, that's what sports is. It's like the sandbox of, of society. It's for children. Well, sometimes when we when we meet our idols or heroes, they disappoint. And, you know, sometimes I don't like to meet people that I really admire because, like, <laughs> it kind of takes the the rose off the yeah. air. But I think in the case of Howard Cosell, was, it, was he just as good as advertised? Like, did you really learn a lot from him? I learned a tremendous amount from him. You know, on the upside, he was even better than I expected because he was incredibly funny. You know, later on, I used to, you know, tell Jerry Seinfeld all the time, I go, God, you're the second funniest boss I've ever had. <laughs> and I'm but, sure he loved that. You know, but he did. <laughs> you know, Jerry used to tell me, I, you know, I used to tell him stories about Cosell and he'd say, you should be doing a one man show. <laughs> you know, the power was so funny. What's one of your best Cosell stories? Typical Howard, you know, he was a big practical joker and things like that. I'll I'll tell you a really quick story. There was this kind of bombshell girl working at ABC Sports, but she was really just the mistress of one of the directors of the show. That's a different Uh, era. She was a mistress of like a a huge director at ABC Sports. Okay. And um, this is pre me too. Pre me again. Yeah. You know, she was known as the Boomer. That was her nickname. Everyone called her the Boomer. Oh, jeez. And, um, you know, like, I didn't know who she was or that she was having an affair with the director. So one night, you know, I was in the broadcast booth at a, at a baseball game with Howard because he had forgotten his ABC blazer. So he called the office, and I happened to pick up, and he says, Peter, I've forgotten my blazer. Pick it up, get in a taxi, and bring it up to me. And then you could sit and watch the game with me. So I did that. 
and I'm I'm in the I'm in the booth and I'm just talking to this bombshell blonde girl and it turns out she lives in my building <laughs> in New York. And you know, I like I'm in the car with Howard after the game coming back and he's saying, You like that girl, didn't you? <laughs> And I'm like laughing, saying, yeah, yeah, Jesus, oh my God. And then two days later, my phone rings at 5.30 a.m. I pick up the phone. Dita, it's Cosell. I know you're in bed with the boomer. Nudge it. I want to speak to her. This is at 5.30 in, in the morning. This is what he thinks to do. Oh my God. He, you know, he's up, you know it, it was unbelievable how funny he was and how far he would go to do like some kind of weird little practical joke like that so after that that experience you go on to to become a freelance writer is that right yes i kind of was looking for another job i got laid off from you know from abc sports mainly because you know the company spent so much money on the 84 olympics that you know they it, it was like a corporate waste playground and you know it was such a great job and nobody wanted to leave that show that you know i was still kind of the junior member you know or within the within i think they had to let go four people and i was one of the four most junior members of the show so i um i got laid off which you know was kind of a good thing you know it was a great experience, but it was kind of time to move on and start writing full sentences again. Yeah. So um, I was looking for another job. And in the meantime, I wrote one kind of humor piece for Mademoiselle magazine. It was a... Uh, Rest in peace, Mademoiselle. Kind of, I remember Mademoiselle quite well. I worked for Condé Nast for a little while, so I do remember that magazine. Oh, uh, <laughs> what's the greatest place on earth. Condé oh, my now. God, the greatest. Yes. I think we just missed each other because I worked at Glamour as well, but um, I think I might have been a little bit after you. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a great experience. But anyway, so you were writing for them. What what article did you end up writing for Mademoiselle? I wrote a piece called "The We Just Broke Up Last Night Diet." <laughs> it was it was basically what a guy eats for the five days after he's been dumped, <laughs> and you know it's basically like coffee and you know half a half a slice of pizza and a cigarette it was like the first humor piece that they had run in a long time by a guy and so they were like all over me to write more and so i just kept writing them you know i was writing like what it's like to date the vegetarian what it's like when you get a new girlfriend and they completely change your wardrobe you know just everything and it was so much fun and i was like wow i can do this you know i could do this for a living and you know like for a lot, and you know, I did not much of a living, but it was yeah. Fun. Back, back then, you could write articles like that and actually pay your rent. Now, you know, they pay they pay less a word now than they probably did in you know. Late oh, eight. it's unbelievable! Yeah, it it's, is unbelievable. It's so sad. I mean, when if you write an article now and they pay you a dollar a word, you're stunned. You're stunned, and, and back then, you know, if you got a dollar a word, you'd be like, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's the only thing that's like depreciated in value in the whole. Well, all right. So you were doing that and you could have just done that. But then what happens? How does how does this transition to Seinfeld happen? Well, it happens by luck, which mm. is, you know, key to everything. When I was in New York, I had met Larry David twice. And, you know, we spent a little time together and we got along and it was and I thought he was really, you know, good guy and he was really funny. Now, at that time, he was like a stand-up comic. He was, like, what was he, what was his... He was a comic. I would say he was a comic, but I would say he was living more off... He wrote a couple of screenplays that got optioned and re-optioned. So, you right. know, like, he was basically living off these one or two screenplays that he had written, you know, and always writing. And I, I had never seen him do stand-up, but I had heard some of his lines, which just cracked me up. And, you know, I, like I said, I spent a little time with him twice, once at a party and once at a share house in the Hamptons. So, you know, I didn't think much of it. And then, you know, I moved to Los Angeles just for kind of a change of life. I just needed to shake up my life a mm -hmm. little bit. I did the so same the thing. four weeks that I spent at the Summer Olympics in 84, I just was like, 
why does everybody make jokes about this town? I think this is great out here. <laughs> so, you know, like I moved out here and I was still freelance magazine writing and I bumped into Larry. You know, he knew I was a writer, but he didn't know that I had never really written dialogue or anything. So he said, you know, I'm doing this little show with Jerry Seinfeld. Maybe you, you give me a writing sample. I'll pass it on to Jerry. Maybe you could write a script for us. And at that time, they had done, I think, three or four episodes. Right. The show was you already know, on there. Very much in doubt whether they would get picked up. And since I had no script to give, I gave a column that I wrote for the New York Times. Also, I guess this is sounding like a recurrent theme, but about this day I spent after a breakup where I walked the entire city of New York and refused to come home until I spotted a celebrity in the street. <laughs> Who was? And it was a very, very well received and got a ton of reaction from and when it was published in the New York Times Magazine. And that was the piece I gave. You know, I later found out that Larry was making the same offer to a lot of different writers and passing their stuff on to Jerry. And somehow that article was the only one that Jerry really took a shine to. So I got a chance to write a script. And, I, you know, I came in and I, I watched the three episodes that they had produced. And I was kind of like suddenly nervous yeah. <laughs> because... I thought it was so good that I was like, oh, my God, this is something I really want, and I don't know how to do it. But, you know, I pitched some ideas, which were, you know, the kind of thing I would pitch to Mademoiselle. And, you know, the main idea was that Jerry kind of, like, loses his focus for a second and tells Elaine that there's an open apartment in his building. Right. And all of a sudden, he realizes, oh, my God, having an ex-girlfriend in the building, I mean, that's going to cramp my whole life. Yeah. You know, I pitched that idea and they said, and they basically said, okay, go ahead, go up and write it. It wasn't like any other show where they would like sit you down and give you beat for beat for beat. And then, you know, you just basically fill in the blanks like it's Mad Libs. You know, you have to write the whole thing. And I, I actually included a whole other story in there that I didn't even tell them about. As I was writing, I thought it would be really funny if they went to you know, a party and George was wearing a wedding ring just to see if it was really attract women. And so that was just thrown in there. <laughs> you know, I, I handed the script in. I drove all the way to Studio City, gave it to Larry and Jerry. And uh, Larry says to me, well, we probably won't read it for a couple of days. And I get home and there's a message on my machine from Larry saying, I lied. We read it right away and it's, it's great. It's terrific. You're terrific. You know, like right then and there, I had this feeling that my life was going to change. That's and, amazing. Uh, how would you teach yourself how to write a sitcom script? Well, it's such a it different all, format than, you know, a Mademoiselle story in some ways. Yes. Well, one one advantage of, of writing for, you know, Mademoiselle one day and GQ another day and the Village Voice another day and the New York Times another day is that you have to be able to adapt your own voice. You know, like you mm -hmm. try to keep your own voice, but you have to adapt it to the publication. And, you know, I, so writing dialogue for Seinfeld was not hard for me. The hard part was, you know, dramatic structure and things like that, which I knew nothing about. Right. And really the first script was that the fact that it came out well was kind of beginner's luck. And, you know, I'd say I spent the next five or six years at Seinfeld struggling with this, you know, just trying to learn how to bring creativity out of myself and trying to be more aware of the of the little thoughts that were going through my head and then just drifting out, you know? I mean, yeah. you know, Larry's so amazing at capturing these tiny little thoughts in his head and turning them into a whole story. He's still amazing at it. Right. Well, he, he always connects everything. He has all those little like observations and funny things, and it always kind of comes together at the end. Was that kind of a secret of Seinfeld, too? Where you, like, There was definitely a formula, right, to a Seinfeld episode. There would be like plot A, plot well, B. It was, it, it was a formula that evolved. You know, it yeah. wasn't like that my first season so much. You know, once Larry's, you know, kind of hit on this thing of connecting up the stories, that became a requirement. 
but you know it wasn't originally like that you know originally the show was a lot looser and a, a lot more time for the for jerry and george to sit in a coffee shop and talk about nothing <laughs> yeah yeah you know which i enjoyed that stuff a lot you know like sometimes when the show got incredibly dense i really missed all those little off the subject discussions well i loved how it just broke all those rules right so in some ways you were writing the anti-sitcom I mean, it didn't follow Absolutely. a lot of follow Absolutely. a lot of the rules. Right. The people weren't particularly likable, although I love every character. But I mean, they're not traditionally likable. Um, <laughs> no, they're horrible. People. They're horrible people. They all want to get ahead in some way, and they always fail. And they're willing to screw. They, they're they're great friends who are willing to screw each other over at a moment's notice. You know, I mean, that uh, that was what was so great. You know, like. They would ruin each other's life. And the next week they were back there. You'd see them back in the coffee shop, happy as clams, you know, just yeah. ready to do it again. Uh, so you, you wrote a few, I, I just have to ask because you wrote a few really classic episodes. I mean, you worked on the show for. I worked on the show really six, 12 seasons, but I wrote episodes in eight seasons. Okay. You know, I wrote one before I was on the staff. The second season was only 13 episodes. So. That episode I described earlier about the uh, the open apartment that Elaine was in, that was the first freelance episode that was produced. And they only did 13 that year. And then I um, left before the final season, but I wrote one episode even after I was done. And my understanding is the way it worked, there wasn't a writer's room, right? It's like the traditional uh, comedies right, now. Writer. You just somebody wrote a script and then would give it to Larry and Jerry and they would kind of fix it or how did it work? Yeah. You'd write a script and Larry and Jerry would give you notes and you'd rewrite the script and maybe you'd rewrite it again. And then at a certain point it would go into Larry and Jerry and they would, you know, close their door and spend, uh, you know, a couple of hours or, or more or less, um, depending on the quality of the script. But, um, you know, my office was, like right next to theirs. And I used to sit there like feeling like this tinge of envy because I'd hear, I'd hear that, you know, they're them talking without really being able to hear the words, but then I'd hear them bust into laughs. And I was thinking, God, they have such a better time writing than I do. <laughs> it is. It must be more. Yeah. Writing is a very, so you usually write alone, right? You weren't bouncing your ideas off a partner or anything like that. No, I, but you know, you'd walk around and to the other writers and, you know, like give them their, you know, ask them what they think about something or throw something past them, you know, I mean, depending on who the writer was. And so, you know, that part of it was very kind of communal, but you were basically on your own. So let's talk about some of the episodes you did. Uh, one of the that are very famous, um, the yada, yada, yada. That's yours. Listen to this. Marcy comes over and she tells me that her ex-boyfriend was over late last night and yada, 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 I'm really tired today. <laughs> You don't think she'd yada yada sex? I've yada yada sex. Really? Yeah. I met this lawyer. We went out to dinner. I had the lobster bisque. We went back to my place. Yada yada yada. I never heard from him again. But you yada yada over the best part. No, I mentioned the bisque. You are the uh -huh. yada, you are the master of the yada yada yada, and that I I was reading somewhere had come. You got that phrase. It goes back to your magazine days, right? For like after some meeting with an editor at a magazine. Yeah, I had a uh, a lunch at the Oyster Bar in Grand Central right. Station with an editor. And we were talking and she twice, she said, yada, yada. And um, I remember thinking, oh, I never heard that. That's kind of funny. It's interesting. And then somehow it popped into my mind, you know, like eight years later. And I was thinking that yada, yada thing. You could really cover up a lot of, you know, sins <laughs> <laughs> with yada. <laughs> yada yada over it. So, um, you know, it's it's amazing how the ideas, how you know, you gotta, you you really have to get lucky, you know, like when good ideas happen. You know, like for instance, you know, the episode called the Sponge. And, you know, I just happened to be driving in my car, and I heard on NPR that the sponge birth control device was basically being taken off the market. And immediately in my head, I thought, oh my God, if Elaine's a 
sponge user, she'd probably buy up a whole bunch of them before they're all gone. But she would only be able to get a limited number, so that would probably change her entire screening process for who she sleeps with. Okay. Yeah, do you have any today sponges? I know they're off the market, but I Actually, we have a case left. A case? <laughs> a case of sponges? I, I, I mean, a case. <laughs> huh. Uh, how, how many come in a case? Sixty. Sixty? Um, well, I'll take three. Three. Yeah. Well, make it ten. Ten? Twenty sponges should be plenty. You say twenty? Yeah. Twenty-five sponges is just fine. Twenty-five? Yeah. You said with twenty-five? Yeah. Yeah. Just give me the whole case. I'll be on that one. It was like I had a whole story in one thought, which was, you know, so lucky but so great. You know, it's the kind of thing that, you know, Larry, ha it happened to Larry like, twice a week. Right. But, you know, for me, it happened once. Well, even like the phrase sponge worthy, which is so good. Um, was that yours or was that something that was added later? So you think you're sponge worthy? Yes, I think I'm sponge worthy. I think I'm very sponge worthy. Run down your case for me again. <laughs> well, we've gone out several times. We obviously have a good rapport. Mm -hmm. um, I own a very profitable electronics distributing firm. I eat well. I exercise. Blood tests, immaculate. Mm -hmm. And if I can speak frankly, I'm actually quite good at it. You gonna do something about your sideburns? Yeah, there? I told you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna trim my sideburns. In the bathroom in your apartment? Cleaned it this morning. Uh huh. The sink, the tub, everything got cleaned? Everything, yeah. Uh -huh. It's spotless. All right, let's go. Okay. You know, I think it was like a combination of me and Larry and Jerry, like just, um, you know, trying to. Yeah, it was great. So I, you know, instead of like having something cumbersome like my screening process, <laughs> you know, if we came up with Spongeworthy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, like, I barely remember like what storylines go with what episodes. So, like, remembering exactly how things came up is a little hazy. Although, I do remember, you know, Shrinkage was another one. Oh, is that yours? The Shrinkage? Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm sorry, I thought this was the baby's room. I'm really sorry. I was in the pool! I was in the pool! Did she do it on purpose? It was my fault, I, I told her the wrong door. I was supposed to see her, she wasn't supposed to see me. So what? Well, ordinarily, I wouldn't mind, but... But what? Well, I just got back from swimming in the pool, and the water was cold. Uh, you mean shrinkage? Yes! Significant shrinkage. So you, you feel you were shortchanged? Yes. I mean, if she thinks that's me, she's under a complete misapprehension. That was not me, Jerry. That was not me. So what's the difference? Well, what if she discusses it with Jane? Oh, she's not going to tell Jane. How do you know? Women aren't like us. They're yeah. worse. They're much worse than us. They talk about everything. Couldn't you at least tell her about the shrinkage factor? No, I'm not going to tell her about your shrinkage. Besides, I, I think women know about shrinkage. How do women know about shrinkage? Isn't it common knowledge? Oh. You know, Larry, I was having a lot of trouble, like, coming up with a beat for that story. And then Larry said to me, what if uh, George goes into the pool and he comes out and it's, uh, you know, it's very cold and then she sees him naked. <laughs> and I thought about it and I said to him, oh, you mean like he has, you know, shrinkage? And Larry immediately says, yes, shrinkage. And use that word, use it a lot. Uh. You know, Larry's confidence in what he believed was funny, it, you know, was just unshakable. There's something in the, the fact that you name these things, like like the close talker or, you know, shrinkage and spongeworthy. It just makes it so much funnier. I mean, not to analyze comedy too much, but the way that you guys would identify these like things that everybody thinks of and then you kind of give it a name. Yeah. It, you know, it's kind of like almost like a pop song. You know, it gives it a little bit of a hook. 
Yeah, it definitely works in writing. I mean, when you're doing magazine articles, I always try to, you know, I remember like, you know, I did like drive by dating and, you know, I would just come up with these like ridiculous phrases. That's a good one. <laughs> Thanks. It was back in the day when drive by shooting was a real thing. Yeah. Yeah, that that was that that would have been that that would have been something we would have used. <laughs> right. Maybe I, my my calling. Um you're right. Yeah, you're it's a, just all luck, right? Late. You're a little late. I was a little late. Well, I always think about, you know, so you one of the things that your character does in your book and I wondered if you do it in real life, is that he writes down like funny observations, like he's like standing by a baggage carousel and he's like emotional baggage, you know, carousel. And and I always I think I've read that Larry does have a notebook and writes down things that he observes. Yeah. Are you are you of that school too? Are you constantly writing stuff down a little book that you Yeah, know? and I and I was doing it long before Seinfeld. Okay. In fact, as I'm sitting in my office home office right now there is a gigantic loose leaf binder with right. like, like, you know, a hundred pages of tiny jottings that I just keep on writing in. And to tell you, to, to show you how long I've been doing this, I basically had this notebook that I've been writing little jottings down since 1984. I was wow. you know, at a Harvard law school doing a piece for, um, you know, Harry Cosell on um, two former basketball players. Well, Bill Russell's daughter and Len Elmore, um, you know, a professional basketball player who we know at the Harvard Law School. And so that's when I bought that notebook and I've been jotting stuff down in there ever since. That's wild. Do you go back and look at, old, like, how do you use it? Do you, do you just go through it? Like, how do you, how do those ideas manifest themselves into actual, like, stories or scripts or book ideas? Uh, you know, that's getting harder and harder because I have so many of them. That I know. The thought of just like, you know, leafing through them is just torture. But, you know, I do it, you know, I try to, and, you know, like I, at least I could look at like the last two or three years because, you know, they're more relevant and hopefully come up with some stuff, you know, but I do look through it a lot and, not so much as far as writing articles, but, you know, especially when I was, you know, still writing pilots or things like that, I would really just take the notebook and, you know, really go through it and, and try to remember some thoughts or find some stuff that would be relevant to what I'm thinking about now. But, you know, that's definitely a grind to have to do that. Yeah. So with Seinfeld... Did you identify with any of the characters more than than others? Like I know that, you know, in Larry, Larry is kind of George. Jerry's obviously Jerry. Did you identify with with the characters? I think I was the only writer who liked writing more for Jerry and Elaine than George and Kramer hmm. because I liked that they were at least somewhat normal. You know, like I could relate to them in certain ways. You know, I and you know, and also I realized very early on that you're not going to write a, a really good episode unless the Elaine story is really strong. You know, you really want the Elaine to be a prime player. You know, it, it was harder because they were, you know, a huge majority of the writing staff was always guys. Yeah, and you know, like. I had more trouble coming up with Kramer stories than anything, you know, like I really did. And then it took me four years to realize, wait a minute, ideas that I think would work well for Jerry might work really well for Kramer because they were smaller ideas, but he could take them to a bigger place. You know, like once I had the idea that Jerry is, discovered to have like a low sperm count and they ask, they want him to wear boxers instead of briefs. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, wait a minute, I could use that for Kramer and it'll be so much funnier. And, you know, well, not necessarily funnier, but, you know, he'll bring it to some kind of crazy play and, you know, it worked great. So, you know, it took me four years to realize, to realize that. that that's a great way to come up with Kramer story. You mentioned Elaine. It was always important to get Elaine's story right. What? Why? Why was that such a big part of it? You know, she was kind of a counterpoint to everything. And, you know, if, if it was just 
the three guys, you know, having strong stories, it just didn't feel balanced and, you know, and, and have like an interesting point of view unless, you know, her story was strong. And, you know, her acting and her line readings were so unique and so brilliant that, you know, I think you, at least I really would miss her if she had kind of a weak episode. And, you know, there were certain episodes where her part got cut a lot and, you know, she would kind of be upset about it and uh, rightfully so. So, you know, I was always like really big on coming up with good Elaine stories. The funny thing is like, you know, I mentioned the sponge, you know, like Carol Liefer told me that everybody thinks, uh, just assumes that she wrote the sponge. And she's always like, no, that was, that was Peter. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, you know, which makes me feel really good because, you know, I wrote something totally from... It was so her. her. Yeah. yeah. What was it like when you would give it to those actors? Like, I was I was watching a bunch of your episodes. Like, I watched The Implant, um, which, was, which, which has Terry Hatcher, a young Terry Hatcher. Um, and I was just watching the way they do their lines. And there's just no way that when you wrote it that you would have had them do it. So was it kind of a revelation to you every time that you would kind of give a script to them and then they would actually act it out where you're like, that's not at all what I ever intended. Every single episode. <laughs> right. Every single episode, especially with Elaine. Yeah. And somewhat Kramer, and somewhat Kramer too, because he was a wild card. But, you know, with, with Julia, I, I was always kind of like blown away by how she read the lines, you know, because it was never anything like what I imagine. And then, you know, you'd always like, oh, that's not right. And then, of course, two seconds later, you're thinking, you know, it's not right. It's better. <laughs> it's a thousand times better. I mean, like, she's just, she's the machine, you know. And, yeah, she's amazing. You know, and the funny thing about her is, as opposed to the other characters, you know, Julia speaks English about as beautifully as any American can, you know, like she enunciates Mm. so much better than everybody else does. So, you know, it made it really funny just the way she said things. Right. I want to talk about your career now, kind of what you did since Seinfeld, because that was a long time ago. I know you show ran and created another show that was on for two years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was that experience a good experience? Uh, Was it was it what's it like kind of coming off the high of a Seinfeld and then, you know, a show that's kind of this amazing, you know, this like legendary show? W- what was that experience like? Was it hard to run your own show? Was it a, a difficult transition? It, to- was, it was much more full of, you know, highs and lows. You know, I mean, there were some gr- there were so many great things about it. You know, like, you know, you're running this show and, I, you know, I, I'm not exactly an MBA, you know, so, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a boss of 125 people. And that part ended up being great because you just realize, like, how many people are, tr- are you know, like, putting in all this effort to make the show great, you know, and, and, and the, the crew, you know, just loved it. And, I mean, I think there were some natural things I did that worked out very well. You know, like it got to the point where, you know, a, a, a cameraman could say, hey, we say to me, hey, Peter, would you, you think it would be funny if, uh, you know, they would give comic suggestions. And I love that they felt free to do that. And um, on the other hand, you know, Seinfeld, which had no network interference at all, you know, I had to suddenly deal with a network. And, you know, like the, one of the first things I learned is that network, network executives, you know, they hated Seinfeld. They liked it as fans, but they hated it because it broke all the rules. You know, like right away, you know, in my, you know, after table, after the first table read of the pilot, you know, one executive says, you know, uh, Robbie sings a little glib. And I said, yeah, because I told him that he should be glib. And they were like, oh, my God, glib, that's terrible. 
you know, and then there was like another thing where like the head of the network actually, you know, had a problem with something and I opened up the script and I, you know, I read, I said, oh, let me check that out. And I, I looked at it. I said, no, I think it's pretty good. What else you got? And, you know, they looked at me like I had just, you know, spoken out in favor of incest. I mean, it was, you know, it was just mind boggling. So, you know, and there was this whole game being played over my head, you know, because I made the mistake of going with ABC and, and you know, him. Yeah. the owner of the, the chairman of Disney was Michael Eisner and I was with DreamWorks who the chairman was Jeffrey Katzenberg and you know they were not only hated each other but they were involved in like a hundreds of millions of dollar lawsuit and so you were sort you know, of in the, the middle of, of that DreamWorks television was the ex-husband of Jamie Tarsus oh <laughs> you my know God. I mean there was all this stuff going on above my head that you know, yeah, maybe you can't control. Bit difficult to navigate. And then what? Uh, you know, yeah, go ahead. For the most part, a great experience. And then what happened after that? You, um, uh, you did you uh, start? You know, developing other shows. What were? What was your? What happened after that? Um, yeah, I, I developed a few and you know, shot a few pilots that either didn't go or I, I don't know exactly know why one of them was really great. You know, I did this one about this couple who had been married now for 3000 years, <laughs> like, like something happened and they, um, they never aged. Oh, wow. That's they a great idea. Way. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there were like flashbacks to them, you know, like, you know, like the husband was invited to the last supper, but he wouldn't go because his wife couldn't come along. And, you know, like he, <laughs> was, you know, he was apologizing to Jesus, you know, and Jesus that's perfect. And was like, oh, that's fine. You'll come to my birthday party. And, you know, the guy says like, oh, when is it? When's your birthday? And he goes, you know, June 8th. <laughs> you, and, you know, I mean, it was really great. And somehow for NBC, just, uh, said no, you know, like nobody could believe it. And then, you know, I'd written this other one that I really, really loved, which I kind of called sitcom noir. It was kind of a combination of airplane meets David Lynch. <laughs> and, um, That's a, you know, these are, they, right. they bought it. And then they said to me, then all of a sudden, like, you know, it was so far out there and they were loving it until they got scared and they were, they called me in and they said, what do you think is going to happen in say episode 18? Right. No, I said, I have no idea. I said, you know, I mean, I know it'll have to remain funny and interesting, but I don't know what's going to happen in episode 18. Nobody writes like that. Boom. Gone. I feel like that's the thing they always ask now. They're like, well, where, where are we on season three? And, What's, you know, like when you pitch shows, apparently you have to, you know, I'm not in that business, but that's what I hear. Um, yeah. You have to be able yeah, to act, map it out. They act, they act as if you could be safe about it. Yeah. You know, that safe way of going about it, a, a way of, you know, ensuring that it'll do better. And there's not. Yeah. I mean, it's just interesting that you couldn't play the Seinfeld card more. I mean, like here you are, you know, behind one of the voices behind the most successful sitcom in the history of television. And you still have a bunch of people telling you, oh, no, it has to be this way. Like, can't you be like, you know yeah. what? Look at Seinfeld. Like, that's one of the most, you know, we did it this way. And I just think that they would give you some license. I don't, it's amazing to me. No, I mean, you know, like, you know, you'd have these arguments about likability. And, you know, I would kind of very politely say, well, what did you think you were getting when you decided to go into business with me? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was with DreamWorks. So, you know, like, and I, I, you know, I, I, Jeffrey Katzenberg was incredibly great to me and kind of paternal. And, you know, he brought me on to help out with, you know, movies and things like that, like Madagascar and, okay. and you know, like I, kind of worked on worked on some other scripts in a very uncredited way mm -hmm. and uh, so you know that was really great uh, you know I wish I had gotten a sitcom that, that had gotten into syndication but you know that didn't happen 
Um, all right, so let's talk about your your other career, which is as a, a novelist, and you've written two novels now. And I want to talk about the second one because that's the one I've read. <laughs> the, the, your most recent one is called Hashtag Me As Well. Tell me why you wrote this. this is this is a it's a, a funny spoof really on on the Me Too movement. Uh, was this one that came out of that that notebook from 1984? No, um, I mean you know maybe parts like of what it. we were just talking about with season 18. You know, like when I started writing this, it had nothing to do with what for, was what eventually came out. But I mean, it all kind of started because I was reading an obituary of Philip Roth mm. and talking about Portnoy's complaint. And I was thinking like, what could I get as obsessed about that as Philip Roth did about, you know, his mother mm -hmm. or, you know, Portnoy's mother, you know, the Jewish mother. Right. And what, what would obsess me the most? And, you know, like, what did I have the most to rant about? Right. And, you know, this went back to sports, especially because of how it goes. Oh, I have this, you know, very kind of dark and um, disturbed view of the whole sports world. And I thought I could go off on great rants about that. And then somehow it, I another obsession that I had kind of drifted into my head, which was I was always wondering what life was like for Matt Lauer and Harvey Weinstein and Charlie Rose mm. and Louis C.K., you know, after they were exposed. Like, could they go out to lunch? Yeah. You know, could Matt Lauer just meet his daughter and have a meal with her? I mean, you know, just the day-to-day -day life of somebody who's been, you know... Singled out, yeah. Been exposed like that. You know, what's their life like? And so, um, you know, those kind of two preoccupations merged into this sports writer. And like we said before, you know, that probably would have been me if I followed all the rules at the Washington Post and, you know, did everything to stay there. Right. And, uh, yeah, he's you. So that's how Marty it Pepper. came about. But what's interesting is the choice you made. What he does is, first of all, he's a really, he's a good guy. Right. So he's different than Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. Like he's not a douchebag. And yeah, but he, he's a good guy, but he starts wondering if he's a bad guy. You right. Know? Right. Yeah. It makes him question his own, his own integrity. But, but what's interesting is what he does is actually not that, I don't want to give away too much, but what he does is not at the level of a Harvey Weinstein or a, did you kind of purposely have him do something that isn't quite as egregious as like a Matt Lauer or Harvey Weinstein? Yes. I, want, I wanted something that was something that might offend certain people. Right. And, you know, in a world now where everybody's sitting at home just waiting to be offended, you know, everybody's so touchy. I keep, I keep saying the world was such a better place when only Jews were touchy. <laughs> it's true. What happened? Yeah. Everybody got so touchy. Everybody got so woke. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, you know what the funny thing is that when I was doing It's Like You Know, I thought of the line that I ended up using in this book. You know, he, he basically is standing around, Arnie Pepper, the main character, is standing around with a bunch of other sports writers, and they're talking about a soft NBA player, a guy who doesn't like physical contact at all. Well, this guy got uh, placed on the injured list. And Arnie, who's a very funny guy, happens to make a joke where he says, God, how long is a guy on the injured list usually for, you know, a hysterectomy? <laughs> and, you know, he's basically just saying that this guy is, you know, a pussy. And, you know, somebody, you know, puts it that on, on Instagram and it goes viral and threatens to ruin his life. The funny thing about that is, that when I was on It's Like You Know, I had that line come into my head, and I couldn't use it on It's Like You Know, but at the same time, Aaron Sorkin was doing Sports Night. And I was thinking about how those people on Sports Center are always trying to be so funny. 
So I actually called up Aaron's director, Tommy Schlamme, and I said, you know, I got this idea that might be good for your show. You know, we're both on ABC. Why not? You know, like, you know, and he said, don't you have your own show to do? I said, <laughs> yeah, I know. But, you know, I can't use this line. I think it might be good for you. So, you know, I, I gave him that line and, you know, I would say, you know, the guy has gone over the line a little bit on a telecast and what happens to him because of that? Right. So Tommy goes, you know, Tommy goes, oh, that's a pretty good idea. I'll, I'll you know, I'll tell uh, Aaron. And, you know, like, I don't hear anything for like a couple of weeks. And then I go to some party for ABC and I feel a tap on my shoulder and it's Aaron Sorkin. He says, can I have a word with you? <laughs> I think, oh my God, he's like offended. What's wrong? What? Oh my God, right? he's mad at me. What? what? And he goes, I just want to tell you that was the, you giving that idea was the blankety classiest thing I have ever heard. That was so amazing that you picked up the phone and gave an idea to somebody else and such a great idea. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm glad you liked it, Aaron, but you know, you got to work on your social cues a little bit. <laughs> I, 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 it's like, you're uh, freaking me out, dude. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, don't say, can I have a word with you? Like, uh, thanks. like you're throwing me into the principal. <laughs> but anyway, you know, our shows both got canceled at the same time. So ABC could make more room for who wants to be a millionaire. Oh, great. You know, they want that on every night. That's why our shows got canceled. You so, know, you know, that line came back to me, you know, X number of years later and, it just seemed perfect for the way the world is now. Well, it, it's interesting because, and this is not in, in any way on par with the Matt Lauer or um, right. Harvey Weinstein, but like I think of like Michael Richards, he had a moment, right, where he said something on uh, off color in a stand-up routine, Michael Richards, who's Kramer, um, and he got, you know, got kind of lambasted much the way Arnie Pepper does, you know, in the, in the, in social media. Were you inspired by that at all? Was that another sort of incident that? No, but it, the, the thought crossed my mind several times since then. I wasn't inspired by that, but the thought did cross my mind. And you know, like I've always had kind of strangely mixed feelings about that because I happen to know that Michael is not the least bit racist. Right. And you know, I think in a way he was, you know, kind of like channeling Lenny Bruce, mm -hmm. but. It didn't work. You know, doing it at the wrong time. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, I keep thinking about what Chris Rock said about it. You know, like people asked him, is, is, is Michael Richards a racist? And Chris Rock was saying, the guy is yelling out the word nigger in a, in a crowded comedy club. What do you have to do to become a racist, to be seen as a racist now? I mean, you know, shoot Medgar Evers. Right. And I was thinking, well, you know, he's got a good point there too. But, you know, the fact is Michael is a really good guy. And he, right. You know, and he, he just made a mistake, you know? You know, I, I in my little notes recently, I wrote down, to err is human, to forgive is asinine. That's where we are now. Hmm. Do you still do stand up? Yeah. Are you very I mean, it's, a, it's a hobby. It's not, yeah. you know, it's a hobby. It's not, you know, a profession. <laughs> yeah. I love well, it. You love I it. I love it. But it's a hobby. And you just you kind of came to stand up later in your life, right? Like that was something that Very much. Yeah. At 50, at 59. Wow. And so are you aware of stuff like that? Are you thinking, "Oh, I better be careful that joke might land and because i know that they, you know there's some comedians that won't even perform at college campuses anymore because they just the crowd is too you know politically yeah. correct or whatever are you do you think about that do you let that sort of censor your comedy i don't know if you make those kinds of jokes anyway like if that would be in your um, repertoire I, I don't make many of them but um i have a couple of jokes that have gone close to the line and I am a, for a while I was very dicey as to whether I was going to keep doing the joke even though I liked it I, I have one joke where I'm at the Museum of Tolerance you know there's a big exhibit about about Islam and what and the whole religion and you know and I say that my takeaway is that it's really a very very beautiful religion and 
it's not fair to let 75 million bad apples spoil a whole bunch. <laughs> and, you know, some <laughs> audiences have been like big laughs and some are like, oh, yeah, they get oh. Nervous. you know, like, I'm like, really? You know? Yeah. It's hard. And the funny thing is, if you add up all the different radical Muslim groups, you know, like Hamas and, you know, I mean, all those groups in Yemen, and, I, you know, they probably are 75 million. <laughs> right. All right. So so let's talk to me about your, your process of writing. What is What do you find the most challenging thing about writing is for you? Just figuring out where the story should wind up, mm. you know? set up a situation and you know this was the same a, a big difficulty i had at seinfeld too was i was great at situation setting up situation and, and how do you resolve it, it? yeah harder to resolve it and that's always the tough part for me but you know i try to make it seem like <laughs> less of a um, of a burden by you know like I'm not a very disciplined person, but when I'm like writing the novel, I'm just thinking, okay, just try to make a little progress every day, even if it's just a paragraph. And the fact is, if you sit down and start writing, chances are you're going to do a lot more than just one paragraph. I'm never going to be, you know, John Updike, who's going to do 3,000 words a day, no matter what. Mm. You know, I could have one day where I do that or one day where I do two paragraphs. So I just tried to make some progress every day and, you know, kind of hope that the end or, or the, the path to the end will show itself. You know, I, it's kind of like that theory you hear a lot about, you know, driving at night, you know, like with the head, the, yeah, that the, see as far as the headlights, you could actually still get there. So are you, when you sat down to write a me as well, did you know how it was going to end? I did not. Okay. No, I you like the process of kind of like discovering it as you write. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I always, you got to come up with. Yeah. I'm know, that way too. Better stuff. And you know, like all of a sudden, you know, you, you go off on some tangent then you go, wait a minute, this could be really good. This could be really important. This might not just be a tangent. Yeah. I like that. I you you, so you don't outline stuff generally. Like you don't like you have a general. Yeah. Like, yeah. Good. I, I mean, like to know that. Cause I'm the same part way. Of, that's part of a journalism background. I mean, you know, not just that, you know, you get used to composing on the keyboard. Right. I was never an outliner. Well, at least in journalism, there is a formula. I mean, for articles, like, you know, you got to have your intro and your nut graph and then you're, you know, and you're, yeah. but, uh, but it's true. Like I never, I very rarely outline stories. I just dive in. No, the um, funny thing probably is, takes me a lot longer, but. You know, the funny thing is, if you, I mean, you look at the front page of the New York Times, like the first story in the upper right goes by the formula for the most part, you know, it's yeah. who, what, where, when, why, and what, ha you know, what happened. But, you know, most of the other articles, they all start out with like a feature lead. Mm -hmm. And then it's like two or three paragraphs before you were finding out exactly what the story is about, yeah. which, you know, it's fine. It probably makes for more interesting reading, but it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm it's sure, I'm sure great. like the old school, like, you know, people are rolling in their grave. Yes. It's definitely like the sort of creative journalism. Uh, new journalism is taken over and it, everything is written now in the style of like, you know, that those guys that came out in the seventies, um, the Hunter S Thompson's and yeah. those guys kind of change the, the, yeah, the new, new journalism. journalism. Yeah. They kind of changed the game. Mike Sager, Mike Sager. <laughs> Peter Melman. Yeah, he does it very well. Mike Sager is the most underrated of all of those. I mean, he is like he's his amazing. Stuff is incredible. Yeah, he is. He's a great writer. Peter, this has been so interesting. Thank you so much for taking the time to to talk to us. Oh, my pleasure. I take you know, I have plenty of time to take out for my empty schedule. <laughs> Thanks so much. I Thanks. really appreciate it. I appreciate it. it. Good luck with the book too. for listening to Write About Now, hosted by my dad, Jonathan Small. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to his podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you may find podcasts. Or you can go to his website, writeaboutnowmedia.com. And listen there. This is Ella, reminding you to 
Do the right thing!